It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Palaisuji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Happy Aloha Friday. Thanks so much for tuning in here to Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise. And Yanji, this morning, we are going to be taking a visit back to the Hawaii State Capitol. That's right. We are joined this morning by Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Luke, joining us from her office at the Capitol. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you both, Ryan and Yanji, for inviting me. It's great to be back on Spotlight. It's great to see you now in your official capacity as Lieutenant Governor. So broad strokes, uh, you know, we had the opening day yesterday. We had we saw that you had a preschool uh, conference or news conference earlier this week that we definitely want to talk about. But just how has it been settling into your new job? You know, it's been really exciting and I have really good staff. A lot of my staff were um or from uh, former staffers when I was finance chair. And so they know state government, they know how departments work. And it's so great to have uh, great people working with me to um, tackle this new job. Uh, it, you know, it was so um, surreal because yesterday was um, opening day or Wednesday was opening day. Um, and for the last 24 years, I've been participating in opening day as a member, but just to be on the other side and sitting there somewhat as a participant and just come back and, you know, with the fanfare and the ceremonies and all the um, the uh, the hope of what this legislative session could deliver. It was really exciting. Well, one of the main initiatives that you are uh, already begun working on is uh, early education and, and preschool. Uh, talk a little bit about this initiative. Uh, this is not something new. This, you know, this is something that has been in the works for some time now, but the governor has entrusted you to kind of help spearhead this. Uh, if you can broad strokes, just paint a picture of where things are at right now uh, and some of the things that are going to be important moving forward in these uh, first initial phase. Yeah. First of all, I'm so thankful for uh, Governor Green, uh, you know, for any governor to entrust a big initiative like this um, on, to uh, LG is uh, just fantastic. Um, that shows the amount of trust we have in, in each other. And that shows the, um, the amount of the collaboration and partnership that we share. Uh, the, we on Tuesday launch um, Ready Keiki Initiative what the Ready Keiki initiative is to ensure that all three and four year olds have access to preschool by year 2032. It is unfortunate, um, you know, uh, my son is now 20, um, he'll almost be 21. And I know Yanji, you have um, uh, young children as well. And it's expensive to send kids to preschool and we want the best for our kids. Uh, right now, there are 35,000 three- and four-year-olds, but only half of them um, go to preschool, and significant number of the, um, the kids who are not going to preschool um, is because uh, the parents cannot afford it or it's not accessible near where they live. And when you think about it that way, um, it's really a social injustice issue. And so I'm just happy to be able to take this initiative on. We know that the legislature allocated $200 million to build up classrooms. Um, can you, t but there is a timeline on that money and actually, uh, you know, actually doing the work in time before that, that funding sunsets. Um, do you think that they will be able to meet that, that the school facilities authority and, and, you know, other agencies that are in charge of that will be able to identify enough locations to spend down that money and actually build these classrooms in time? Yeah. Uh, so let's go back to the 35,000 number. Uh, so currently there are 35,000 kids who are three and four year olds. If 18,000 are already going to preschool, that leaves about half 18,000. What we have estimated from um, some of the universal pre-K or pre-K expansion 
around the nation is that about 20% will always opt not to send their kids to any type of preschool uh, program because um, they trust their family more or, you know, they could be homeschooled. And uh, just face it, you know, these are three-year-olds and they're babies and they don't believe in an uh, institutional setting at that um at that age and we have to respect that so because of that when we delete out the 20 percent who may opt out we leave around 9,000 kids who are currently underserved if you look at putting 20 kids in a classroom that amounts to about 465 classrooms that we need to build in the next 10 years as mandated by the legislature 465 is a very doable number. And as chair of the finance committee last year, um, before I left the legislature, we made sure that we, we uh, funded the construction of building out uh, these classrooms. Um, it has a short time fuse. Uh, it's that was done on purpose because we want to make sure that we challenge the departments and we challenge the agencies to get the best plan and get it done within a very short time frame, And I was part of that decision as well. So I stick by that deadline. I am confident that we can use the entire 200 million in the next two years. We have already plans um, that identify over 80 public school classrooms that can be built right away. So we're very excited about this initiative. Beyond just the infrastructure, there obviously will also have to be personnel and employees and, and staffing that are qualified to be able to take this on. We know the Department of Education continues to struggle to fill some of the teacher shortages that uh, has plagued the department and the state for some time. How do you see filling the void of uh, staffing these classrooms and ensuring that uh, there are those teachers and those caretakers who are equipped to handle this uh, and at the volume at which you'll need to get this going? Yeah, Ryan, I think that's a really good question. And what is so good about this Ready Kiki uh, initiative is that we're not just looking at construction, we're looking at, we recognize that it doesn't make sense to build all these classrooms if we don't have teachers and teachers assistants to fill these classrooms. So we're looking at a holistic approach. And so one of the things that we have done, which is part of the initiative, is that we recognize a teaching pathway so we have worked with the University of Hawaii to make sure that there's a preschool built on every campus. There might be more built at UH West Oahu. So these will not only be preschools to provide services for the community, but this will be teaching pathways so that students can go into the classroom, have practicum experience and real experience and those will be part of the credits um, to make sure that you know they have the degrees. In addition to that, we have identified three high schools. Um, you probably heard about the early college program already. Uh, Waipahu has a really successful early college program where your kids are graduating from high school with not just a high school diploma, but with an associate degree. And it is really exciting and that has been um, one of the visions and one of the uh, things that have been spearheaded by the current superintendent. So one of the things that we work with the superintendent and the DOE is identifying three high schools where preschools can be built on high school site. And high school students can go into the classrooms and have um, teaching experience and work towards a associate degree to obtain a teaching degree. Uh, we're also working with the university and um, private universities like Shamana to develop a program um, that will generate a, a, a preschool assistant, um, teaching certification, and also preschool. Going back to the teacher shortage, teacher shortage issue is a real problem. But when we delved into um, the numbers and we did some research, the shortages are mostly at the high school level and specific subject matters. And it's not so much at the, the pre-K elementary. And right now there are potentially about thousand available teachers with an early education degree because um, 
University of Hawaii degree allows you to teach, the, the degree that you get in early education allows a teacher to teach anywhere between preschool to third grade. So you could actually have third grade teacher who is not working, who can go into the preschool classroom and teach right away. And we've identified about 100 teachers who can potentially work right now. Interesting. So I know that you said at the top that this isn't going to be full scale till 2034. But in the meantime, of course, there's a lot of years in between. So do you envision, um, you know, a certain percentage opening every year until we reach that full threshold? And, and how soon could these opportunities start to become available for families? Yes. Um, so unlike in the past, when the the state has looked at building out preschools, maybe in a very um, slow pace. So, you know, I think uh, in certain years, we open maybe 10 preschools. Uh, what we're hoping to do is open up 80 preschools by, um, by the start of the school year in 2024. Uh, right now, we're working through um, um, Department of Education and other agencies to see if we can actually try to expedite that and have few classrooms open by 2023. Uh, start of the school year in 2023. We're being very aggressive because um, this is, even if it's a 10-year plan, if we can try to build as many classrooms and fill those seats earlier, we are trying to do that. And that's why, you know, in as much as um, you know, we have a 10-year window, um, we're challenging departments and agencies to build basically uh, 80 to 100 classroom in the, the first two years. And if you can be, you know, explain where these locations might be, because this obviously is a statewide initiative. This is not confined here to the island of Oahu. The needs of parents on the Big Island Kauai are the same as here on Oahu. Um, how, how do you plan to scale this statewide to be able to facilitate the needs of neighbor island folks as well? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So currently, um, the the Elementary schools that have been identified for locations for preschools um, is statewide. Uh, we have identified in working with Department of Education and charter schools to look at schools on every island. And of course, you know, because we're looking at underserved areas, these are areas that are is not necessarily just urban Honolulu or workplaces, but these are going into the very rural areas. The other interesting thing, um, which is different from our traditional approach of opening um, preschools at elementary states, uh, elementary schools, uh, as I explained, you know, we're looking at the part, um, university sites. We're also looking at the um, high school sites. The other thing that we are doing is um, we will also be looking at libraries because there's a library in every community, even you know in Moloka'i, they had an uh, expansion in their library. Uh, Lana'i, um, uh, every um, community has a library. So we're looking to partner with libraries to open up preschools on library sites. That's a, that's a you know a wonderful idea. I think about when I go to North Kohala to visit my mom. That Javi Library is so nice, and my kids love it there. Um, I'm thinking also, does this is this all day? I know that some of the private preschools, for instance, do half day programs. You know, just to get things started, so that parents can at least have some uh, childcare option there, and that these kids can get at least a little access to learning. Would you um, think about scaling this up so that it would be half day or just a few days a week? Or, or how is this actually going to look? Yeah, so the Ready Kiki initiative is, uh, we call it um, kind of, we, we are trying to do everything, right? So it's not just a public model. We're also looking at the private model as well. So in, in at the same time as at the same time we're building out uh, public preschools on uh, UH campuses, on DOE campuses and, li and libraries, one of the things that we want to do is we want to expand services on the private side. Um, because one of the things that is attractive for uh, a parent, a working parent um, like you, UNG, is to make sure that you have services from 7 a.m. You can drop off your um, child as early as 7 a.m. and uh, has, have the flexibility to pick your um, 
son or daughter up as late as 6 p.m. And a public school cannot offer that. You know, the public school is only open from 8 a.m. to 2.15 or 8 a.m. Um, to 1.30 on Wednesdays. Um, there is currently a state program called Preschool Open Doors. And Preschool Open Doors is a subsidy to low-income families um, to offset the cost of preschools. Right now, the state provides about $12 million to, uh, to subsidize 1,400 kids. But we're only providing um, services for four-year-olds. And the last thing that we want to do, I remember my son, um, first day of preschool, just crying and he cried for, I, I, you know, now it seemed like he'd been crying for a month, but I'm sure it wasn't that long. It was just so traumatic. Um, but can you imagine trying to, um, after he gets adjusted to a, a uh, preschool when he's three and then now you got to change schools when you, you're four and that's like a trauma that you don't want to place on your child so the preschool open doors only provide services for four-year-olds so what we would like to do this year is expand preschool open door subsidies to include three-year-olds so that you know that you will have continuity is in services. So that could potentially service a lot more parents and a lot more kids by expanding that. The preschool option on the private side offers those extended hours. So we'll be working closely with the private providers. At the same time, we're building on the public side. Well, it sounds like there are a lot of moving parts to this program uh, and something that you guys are continuing to work through. So thanks for that update. We want to switch gears a little bit as we continue to move through the show and, and talk about other things that you may be working on. This is a, a unique role uh, in the lieutenant governor's role where each person who has assumed this role of lieutenant governor has taken on different initiatives, built it around their skill set and things that they are passionate about. We've seen uh, this through various administrations. Well, what are some of the other areas or key um issues that you will be focusing on here in the next four years? The other uh, issue that I will be focused on is broadband expansion. The last two years uh, when we were shut down, we um, realized that broadband and internet reliable service is a must uh, as we're going um, uh, coming out of the pandemic, we're still using Zoom and we're still doing telemedicine and remote working and um, distance learning. And I think uh, we all as a community realize that broadband and reliable internet service is a must in our community. Uh, right now, there are um, pockets in our state um, um, that still don't have reliable internet service or slow internet service. I um, Every time I visit Lanai, I just can't even get internet service, even at the airport. And you would think at the airport, you should be able to get, you know, few bars, but, um, you know, reliable internet service is uh, something that will lead to equity. So, you know, for our kids and the future generation, it's giving them the opportunity for the possibility of being able to live here and have uh, work out of DC or work out of Silicon Valley or work out of even Japan and have that reliability and connectivity. Um, we are in a situation where, where we are getting, we have gotten so much funding from the federal government to shore up our broadband uh, infrastructure. And we as a state don't want to blow that opportunity. And, you know, it's in the upwards of hundreds of million dollars given to different departments. So in order to coordinate that, um, uh, I am helping to spearhead and manage the, the um expending of those services so that you know the most remote areas get the internet service but it's not even just remote areas because you know even in downtown honolulu when a bunch of us um get on the internet at the same time or you know when you're at the concert and we're all streaming at the same time it's slow and uh, that's what we need to fix and that's what we need to figure out so the money is there it's just a matter of coordinating all of those different initiatives yeah, isn't that the best scenario where the federal <laughs> government provides the money and it's really figuring out what we need to do to best serve the public? So I think that the both initiatives, I'm just for, so fortunate that, uh, you know, 
it's really the implementation and execution that I'm helping with because the funding is there, funding is available, and it's just trying to maximize that and making sure that we deliver for the public. And I feel that that's a continuation of my role from finance year where I was very um, strict in the use and of funding, especially when it came to taxpayers' money. So it's an extension of what I have been doing as finance chair. So I feel so lucky to be in this position. I wonder if you can share a little bit more about your working relationship with the governor and how things have uh, worked out in the first few weeks here. Uh, how often do you folks get together to talk and, and meet? And, and are you in cabinet meetings? If you can explain just uh, the overall dynamic and the workflow with you and the governor. Yeah, the governor and I get, uh, we talk all the time, you know, there are situations where, you know, he would text me, I would text him just to say, hey, how's it going? And sometimes it might be stressful and just uh, just do a temperature check on each other and making sure that we're okay. Um, I uh, We have cabinet meetings every week and I'm included and, you know, we have really good dialogue and uh, with all the cabinet um uh, key cabinet members and just to uh, find out what the major issues are and how we can help each other. In addition to that, I meet with him privately where we can just chat and talk about, hey, what are, how do we resolve some of these issues and how do we um, uh, try to help each other? So it's been great. You know, I mean, uh, it's just been um, a month and a half since we got, um, we went through inauguration, but we both feel like uh We've been at this job for so long and we're just so both very thankful uh, to the public and to the people for allowing us um, uh, this trust uh, to take care of the public. We know that uh, it sounds like you're both in alignment when it comes to your workflow and working together to get some initiatives done. But I'm interested because, of course, you're two different people and you may have differing opinions. What are your thoughts on the governor's, you know, stated primary initiatives when, when we're talking about the so-called green fee, which is this p potential tourism or on arrival fee to come to Hawaii, uh, and then also the uh, the GET elimination on food and medicine. Do you agree with his policies on that? And will you help to shepherd those through uh, down on the legislative floor? I think that's the, the great part about the governor. Um, one of the things he recognized right away, um, you know, he understood that it's not so much the, the specific legislation that needs to pass, it's what is the intent behind the legislation. So the um, GET on food and medicine, he, uh, we talked about that and, you know, it came down to, okay, what is he trying to do? He's trying to relieve the tax burden of the working families, um, the working families who um, struggle with the cost of, um, not just food, gas, rent, everything, uh, including childcare. And that's why the early learning initiative is important. But in the end, uh, we both recognize that it's the legislature that needs to pass it. I know the legislature has some ideas on how to tackle these issues. And it, it is about collaboration as opposed to putting your stamp on this idea and making sure that this specific thing passes. Uh, as far as the green fee is concerned, um, the what is the 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 reason for passing the green fee it is really trying to put an impact fee on um, tourists um, who use our infrastructure use our roads use our services and making sure that tourists pay a share of the burden that taxpayers pay um, so uh, even if it cannot be assessed at the airports, because we do understand that there's restrictions in assessing on airline tickets or at the airport, it could be impact fees throughout. And we have examples, uh, successful examples of where impact fees have been really successful. So again, it, it is really about taking an idea. Why or um, why was he trying to uh, bring that issue forward and then figuring out and working with the legislature, how do we get that same result, even if it may not specifically be exactly what uh, it was described initially? You know, we always like bringing in questions from the audience. This is an interesting question uh, about the Department of Labor. Uh, and through the pandemic, this is from uh, Laura, you see here, navigating unemployment was a nightmare. Many 
suffer crippling financial harm while waiting for months for the Department of Labor to get their act together? What is the administration's plan to address these types of issues moving forward? Also, does the Green administration have any plans to address long-standing problems with CVS and foster care program? If we can focus on the first half of that question, maybe, um, with the Department of Labor and some of the issues that happened during that were brought to light uh, during the pandemic. We know that you firsthand also got involved and worked at the convention center to help shore up some of those unemployment claims. I mean, what is being done uh, as far as you know, within the department to address some of those concerns about the mainframe and the infrastructure that held so many people up? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, one of the things, uh, I mean, you know, it was always evident that um, um, when the pandemic happened and the unemployment office um, had to process claims. The, the number of claims that they had to process went from 2,000 to 200,000 overnight. Um, there's no agency, uh, whether it's public or private, that can handle that kind of um, increase in volume. But what happened during the pandemic was we recognized the um, insufficiencies of the IT system. We looked at how we can um, um, expedite some of the claims processing. So right now they are working in improving the IT system um, to make sure that it's not just to be ready for the next pandemic, but to ensure that the unemployed population get their claim process in an expedited way. I do want to talk a little bit about CPS. Um, CPS, uh, you know, it's that has been a passion of mine for the last uh, couple of years. We have um, just, horrendous stories of um, children being abused and children being neglected. And sometimes, you know, I mean, um, it's some, uh, you know, uh, we have really sad stories coming out. Uh, we have a duty to uh, figure out how we protect children who are under the jurisdiction of the state, uh, whether it's foster kids or, you know, in, um, different type of uh, um, state jurisdictional setting. So we are working closely with um, Child Welfare Services um, to boost up um, uh, foster care uh, training um, to ensure that we change processes within. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to work hard on this because it's, you know, we, we, you know, it just breaks my heart every time you hear another story of um, this, uh, a terrible tragedy that happens to kids under the jurisdiction of um, child welfare service. I want to bring in another viewer question before we run out of time, and this is going back to the preschool initiatives. Ingrid's asking, will some of the money be used to raise preschool teachers' pay so that enough and high-quality teachers will be attracted? We know that on the pay scale, uh, preschool teachers uh, tend to be paid, uh, you know, at the lowest rates. So they don't. Uh, so, is that part of the equation that you would raise teacher pay, uh, or are there other ways that you would try to compensate teachers? Could there be housing vouchers? Could there be other creative ways to try to attract teachers? Teachers to these positions? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, so one of the things, because we are increasing the, the subsidy through preschool open doors, uh, we're not just increasing by adding three-year-olds, we will be increasing the subsidy amount. Uh, what we're hoping is that the increase in subsidy amount will result in higher teacher pay. Um, what we have found just recently in talking to some of the providers is a lot of the seats, the private um, preschool seats are not filled because they don't have enough teachers. So we're trying to help the private um, private preschools by increasing the preschool open door subsidy so that it can result in a better teacher pay. Well, we are almost out of time, uh, but before we let you go, just want to allow you uh, a quick final message here for those watching uh, as you navigate this new role as Lieutenant Governor uh, and moving forward, working with the governor, your message for uh, our viewers this morning. Well, you know, I just want to thank you, NG and Ryan, for this opportunity. The, the goal that we have in uh, our office is just to change how state government does its work, you know, whether, uh, no matter what it is, just reinventing and re-envisioning how state does its business. And no matter what it is, uh, we have to remember why we're here. We're here to serve the public in a way that it's efficient, where the way that it makes sense for them. So we will be working hard to make Hawaii and uh, make our state government work for you. 
Okay, Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Luke joining us from the state capitol this morning. Thank you so much for being here. We look forward to more conversations in the future. Thank you. Thank Hello, you. Thanks. Great to talk to her and hear about those two major initiatives that the governor has tasked her with. Of course, the Ready Cakey uh, program that she unveiled earlier this week, looking to spend the money that the legislature has allocated to build out these classrooms and also looking to try to fill those teacher positions. They're trying to do it in a number of creative ways, whether it's high school students building at the high schools themselves. It's a very interesting thought uh, using existing resources like libraries uh, and then, of course, bringing in university students as well, um, as well as perhaps trying to increase teacher pay in the private schools uh, by expanding preschool open doors, which uh, for those of who aren't familiar is a preschool subsidy that helps parents pay for private preschool through tuition reimbursement. So very interesting to hear, you know, long term, it's going to take till 2034 to get everyone who needs a seat or who would like a seat rather uh, full access. But in the meantime, they do hope to slowly scale up. And she's saying adding, you know, 80 to 100 classrooms every year until they reach that final goal. Yeah, and just interesting to see just the overall plan and how much work is going into this. We talked about the hours, of course, that would uh, these preschools would be open. There's a lot of moving parts when trying to unveil a program of this magnitude on a statewide level. Uh, so there are not only the construction issues and, and matters that need to be addressed, but also the personnel that she addressed as well. Uh, so this is a big initiative. This isn't just some uh, policy that they're rolling out. This is going to be something that will obviously take some time. Uh, but you heard from the lieutenant governor, uh, uh, she has this confidence that this is something that they are challenging departments to do, she said, that they want to make sure that they do this in an efficient and timely manner. And so uh, we'll see a, a, a very big first test for her as she settles into this new role. She also talked about broad, uh, broadband expansion and that Internet access and making sure that rural communities, as well as those uh, here in the urban core of Honolulu, also have uh, you know, not only access to it, but reliable access to the internet and ensuring that that will help to create equality and equity through various sectors of our social and economic scale. Yeah, and you hear there also about her working relationship with the governor, uh, a, a departure, I would say, from the previous administration, uh, the two of them texting, meeting regularly, really trying to align in their initiatives and making sure that their priorities and as, as an administration are enacted upon. You have heard her there uh, make a distinction between supporting the initiatives that the governor has laid out with the green fee um, and also with the elimination of uh, GET on food and medicine, saying that those Necess won't necessarily be the initiatives that actually go through, but that the intent of those two priorities are really what they're hoping to act on. So a little bit of a departure, not saying that she's going to support those particular uh, executions full-throated, but maybe trying to get there uh, just perhaps in a different way. Yeah, and, and as someone who has worked on the Finance Committee, obviously, and spearheaded that, she really has an idea of how to navigate through some of the legislative matters and how to uh, you know, appropriate tax brackets and codes in order to really meet the intent of what the governor had initially laid out. But always great uh, talking with her. And of course, in this new role as lieutenant governor, we look forward to more conversations with the lieutenant governor in the months to come, uh, as well as the conversations that we are scheduled to have next week. That's right. Some interesting guests that we haven't heard from a in a while. Uh, Chip Fletcher from UH Manoa, the climate scientist there, will be joining us to talk about climate change, how it's affecting us here in Hawaii, what we all can do and where we're seeing it in our everyday lives. So very interesting, obviously, to check up with him. It's always a sobering conversation with Dr. Fletcher, but a necessary one. And then on Wednesday, we'll be talking to Christina Baer. She is the attorney, one of several attorneys, who's spearheading the class action lawsuit suing the Navy on behalf of families affected by the Red Hill fuel spill. Uh, we'll be talking to her about where that lawsuit stands, what they're seeking. We know that they were out here uh, actively seeking more plaintiffs. So we'll be talking to her about what exactly they're seeking and what damages she thinks that these families deserve. So we look forward to that conversation on Wednesday. We hope that you have a great weekend. We'll see you right back here on Monday for another edition of Spotlight Hawaii. Have a great weekend. We'll see you then. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.